Okay, so the display on the oven is out. We're gonna try to troubleshoot it. Um, you can see the display is out, but the buttons are all responsive. So at least we know we're still getting power to the circuit board. Okay, so there's like a 25 minute oven circuit board repair video out there where after about 20 minutes, the guy gets finally gets the circuit board. He's been just turning screws the whole time. And then he says, okay, we got the circuit board. We're gonna send it off and get it repaired. That's not what I wanna do here. I actually wanna get the board out and just do some common troubleshooting, electronics troubleshooting, see if we can fix it. If not, happy to send it off, but I think we can do better. And I hope this is of use to you. First rule, don't kill yourself. Flip the breaker off, make sure you know which one. If you don't know which one, just turn the power to the whole house off. We're gonna need a screwdriver, a soldering iron, and maybe a multimeter. So the first thing you need to do is figure out how you can get at the board. In my case, it's recessed into the cabinet, so I had to remove a couple trim screws to pull off these moldings, and then there were actually a couple screws that were anchored in, you know, to the surface of the cabinet, um, then more trim screws up on top, actually, to get the remaining molding off. I had to pull the oven out a little bit of ways, and then I could get to the board. First thing to check out is the fuse. Well, in my case, I had uh, res you know, a responsive keypad as evidenced by the beeps that were going on, but I'm going to go ahead and check it anyway. Um, fuses come in various shapes and sizes, so this is kind of almost location dependent, but you definitely do want to check to see, uh, you know, make sure that the fuse isn't blown on your oven. Okay, so before you start breaking off these brittle old plastic connections, do a visual inspection of the entire area. Think of it like you're a detective looking for anything that might have, say, mechanically failed over time. Maybe some wire nuts, twisty caps pulled loose. Could be a wire was getting pinched by a cabinet door and failed over time. If it's an older house, go ahead and run some basic continuity tests. The point being that there's risk once you start removing the board. You don't want to start troubleshooting all the individual components only to find that a mouse chewed through your hot wire and is sitting up in there. So, you know, do some due diligence on the front end just to make sure. The next part is to patiently, carefully remove those plastic connectors. Uh, remember, you know, ovens get hot, so a lot of times these things might be a little bit more brittle than what you're used to. Uh, you can rock them back and forth if you need to a little bit. Oftentimes that kind of, you know, starts working them loose there. Again, if you need to take a step back and, and relax, it's best to approach this when you're not in a big hurry and just very patiently try to remove those connections. Once all the connectors are loose, just kind of carefully take it off and make sure you've got a clean surface to set it down on. Okay, so we got the whole control board assembly disconnected. Usually these LED or LCD displays are uh, connected via zebra cables to the main board. And very often that is uh, an area where there's a lot of problems. You can find tons of videos on correcting that. In this case, the display is actually soldered onto the main board, but there's a touchpad control board that's connected via a zebra cable. So I need to get at both sides of the board. I'm going to do basically the same thing, but I'm going to carefully remove uh, the zebra cable, clean it off, and go over both sides, and then we'll move on to checking how this display is connected to the main board. Okay, so you just want to make sure the display is connected properly, that you know each individual joint is is good. So I spread some flux out over this, made sure my iron was hot enough, and again, kind of very slowly, methodically work your way through. If your eyesight is no longer great, you want to get, uh, you know, use a microscope or something so that you're not getting any bridges in there or burning the board or anything, but just, you know, work your way through there and make sure all those connections are good. The next thing I'm going to do is replace the electrolytic capacitors. This particular board was made in 2003, so that means that it's 18 years old, 2021 now. Um, there's only five capacitors on the board. I've got most of them. There's only a couple that I don't have, uh, so I don't want to advertise for anybody, but, uh, you know, reach out to whoever you typically buy your electronics components from and get uh, replacement capac uh, capacitors. This is pretty easy to do. Uh, again, there's videos all over. If you're not familiar with it, make sure you short them out. And uh, yeah, here we go. You don't need a multimeter here. You just have to make sure the polarity is correct when you're replacing them. Uh, typically, there's a negative indicator on both. You can see on the silk screen on the board as well as on the capacitor itself. Um, so again, just make sure you get the polarity correct. You can check them in line with something like an ESR meter, 
Um, but if you're going to go through the trouble to lift up a leg and pull it halfway out anyway, I figure you may as well just pull it all the way out and replace it. And remember, if you are testing them on a multimeter too, a lot of times multimeters only test up to 10 microfarad or 50 microfarad or something. And these, I think, go up to about a thousand, at least on, on the board I'm working with. So in that case, then to like an LCR meter or something is, is what you need. Quick note on uh, replacing capacitors. I just watched a guy who advocated, uh, you know, heating up on the underside and, and literally walking, rocking the capacitor back and forth to try to move it down and get it, you know, all the way seated into the board. I prefer to do it a little bit differently. As you can see there, I use the wick to, um, you know, completely clean off the, the where the old solder is and then go through, insert the new component, bend the legs to make sure it's firmly seated, then use fresh solder to make sure there's a nice clean connection. So you don't need this next tool, but I want to use it to illustrate what the problem is. Um, but, you know, I'm getting older. My eyes aren't as good. And it's, it's worth noting, I guess, these things are about 50, 60 bucks on Amazon. And uh, they, they work fantastic. So I could see something was wrong here, even without uh, magnification. And when I started looking at it, I'm not sure whether the... Uh, so I could see something was wrong here, even without magnification. And when I pulled this capacitor, it was in fact bad. So I'm not sure whether the bad capacitor heated up and, and caused this, uh, you know, this joint to go bad, or whether it was the other way around and it just it had never been a very good connection. And eventually, it, you know, caused the capacitor to fail. But in any event, I think we've got a likely candidate for, uh, you know, what the problem was with this circuit board. So I'm gonna go ahead and try to fix this, and we'll work on it from here. Sorry, just to clarify what we're looking at here too. So you can see that the trace has physically pulled away from the board. And when I went to, you know, move this capacitor, it wasn't even connected. I could pull it directly out without even, you know, touching uh, this big dollop of solder you see there. So basically it, uh, you know, physically was no longer in contact. Again, not sure how that happened, but, uh, you know, definitely it was not making contact and that's that's got to be a problem. My strategy is going to be to clean off the uh, contact there super glue down the entire trace and uh, make sure the pad is connected and then uh, just replace the capacitor and, and keep moving. So quick summary, don't kill yourself and don't break anything worse. Then remove the screws so that you can access the uh, oven. And once you get in there, make sure the fuse isn't blown, check the wiring, check the connectors to the board, then look at the display connection. That's a likely candidate. Then replace the capacitors. Finally, if there's any other uh, suspect components in there, you might want to check those out. Once you do all that, connect your fuse back, uh, you know, connect the board back together. You don't have to put all the screws in yet, flip the breaker back on, and, uh, you know, hopefully you'll get a response from your board and everything looks good. If that's the case, then just go ahead and complete the job, finish it out, put it back together. Um, if you don't, then you've got a decision to make. You have either need to continue troubleshooting the board and kind of at the point of diminishing returns, right? So the other thing you can do is, you know, find somebody, send the board off to a place that replaces them, or even find a replacement board. And then, you know, you're far enough along where you can do that as well. So whatever it is, good luck. I hope this helped you out and uh, good luck. Okay, so the moment of truth is coming. Drum roll, and here we go. Let's see, is it going to turn on? And it worked. So I got lucky. Um, you know, you never know what you're up against, but this has probably saved me a couple hundred bucks, and it's, it's not that big of a job. Uh, you can get it done in a couple hours, and like I said, good luck to you.